Welcome back into room 442. Guys, we are days away from the World Cup starting. Albert Vartanian, Michael Singh, Sarah Peraria. Gentlemen, four days away. Are we excited? Of course, <laughs> yeah. We were just talking about it on the build of the show prior to this one, but like it feels like it's taking me a while to like really get excited for it. It's like there's like some force field between yeah. me and the World Cup, but now it's starting. I think that's all because, you know, club fixtures just ended. So now we can really start looking forward to it. Yeah, I know. It started for me when Canada announced their World Cup squad. That's something like yeah, that's good. I'm that's really good. feeling. There's certain moments along the way, like when Canada qualified for <laughs> for the World Cup, where you're like starting to really get excited for this thing. And I think that was another uh, milestone along the way. Yeah, absolutely. Well, one thing we always talk about during the World Cup is, of course, who are the favorites? Who's likely to win? But then there are the dark horses. So let's take a look at that today, because there's a few. Mm -hmm. And it's always hard to kind of pinpoint, mm -hmm. but let's start with number one that we think is a dark horse is the Netherlands. Now, if you look at this team, I feel like they should be a lot better than what people are kind of ex expecting them to do. Mm -hmm. But everyone I've spoken to, the more I look into this team, I don't actually expect much from them besides maybe getting out of the group. Mm -hmm. That's just my opinion. But what do you guys think? Netherlands a dark horse? Maybe that's why they're a dark horse. Yeah. It's because, yeah, there's a lot of people that are overlooking this team. Listen, peren perennially? Perennial. Perennially? Yeah. I, <laughs> God, I can't speak. Um, yeah, the Netherlands have found ways to go deep in tournaments. You know, it's either they completely flop or they go pretty deep into tournaments. And what I like about this Netherlands team is... A, the squad itself, I think, especially that back line, I think they have one of the best defenses in the tournament. But B, their group. Mm -hmm. They have a pathway to the knockout stages that I don't think many other teams have. I'd argue that Netherlands are in the easiest group, right? So if they can get into the knockout rounds, we know this team has proven that they can play knockout-style football. Yeah, I, I think they're a dark horse. Yeah, they could be. But based on the odds, they have better odds to win this thing than Portugal. So, I mean, maybe they're a dark horse because they're not really being talked about. I don't really like them that much. There, there's a, le a lot to like about their team. Uh, if Memphis Depay is fit, I mean, you can probably throw them into the category, into the pool of players who can win the golden boot. On mm -hmm. penalties, you know, one of the top scorers for the Netherlands. But they're missing some key guys. And the number one key guy for me is Georgino Wijnaldum. He was so important to this team, especially at the last Euros and throughout qualifying. So I think them missing that key player could really hurt them. And at the back, they decided not to take Jasper Sillison, mm -hmm. who's been the number one keeper for a while I think now. Only six caps between all of their goals. Yeah, so best. I mean, maybe those other three keepers can can do a job, but I think you're missing that experience there. But in front of them, you have Van Dyke and Delict. So obviously, I'm waffling here. I don't know where to go. <laughs> but I'm, I'm going to say no to Netherlands, but they're definitely in the category. Okay, next up, we have to talk about Uruguay. <laughs> what a team they are. Um, they're in a really tough group arguably one of the toughest, Portugal, South Korea, and Ghana. Mm -hmm. But when you look at this Uruguay squad, they have some serious talent. And something that we've been talking about, I feel like I'm always telling you guys this, is these players that are playing for Uruguay right now have also been having a season individually. Mm -hmm. When you look at Bentancur for Tottenham, Fede, Real Madrid, even Luis Suarez at Nacional. Darwin Nunez is starting to turn on your day. Darwin right? is away. Yeah, all these players. What do you guys think? Can can they go the distance? Me personally, I don't believe that this Uruguay team can go the distance or make a deep run into the tournament. And hey, maybe I'll be wrong in a couple of weeks. But just the way, especially when I watch them play against Canada, they weren't convincing to me as a one of those. It's a friendly mic. What is the? They yeah, you're were, right. They were missing a lot of players though. Uh, an okay, they had a strong squad that they did throw out there. Yeah. But but yeah, I'm not convinced that this team is one of the elite teams at this World Cup. I think they're they're older for sure. If you're relying on a guy like Luis Suarez, who what? How old is he now? 36, 37, 38. He's still scoring goals though. Yeah, in Uruguay, right? He he was doing the same when he was at Barcelona not too long ago. He's like. But I, I will say I will say this: so you don't necessarily. You're not watching these guys. I'm just saying. You, know, you, you don't. You don't necessarily. If they're leaning on Suarez, it's a problem. But you don't necessarily need. Uh, out and out striker to go to distance. I was just looking at numbers of, of teams that won the World Cup. And you go back to 06 with Italy. I know Italy's a different team, defensive minded. They had two strikers. They started Luca Toni and Mazzarazzi. Mm -hmm. They combined for two goals, two total goals. It's rare that like you have this pro, a, a winning team has a prolific striker. I mean, the last time we saw it was 02 with Ronaldo. 
but they have know, everything else. The difference between Italy and Uruguay is Italy's defense. The defense was huge. Yeah. Incredible. That's where yeah. I had to take issue with this Uruguay team. Totally Their back yeah. line has a lot it's of also, question that's marks. That's where I think the age really comes into yeah. it. Because that's where like Caceres is still yeah. playing. <laughs> but you have this like this team like they will die for the shirt. And you can say it about so many South American teams. Yeah. Like I think back to Suarez when he stopped the ball against Ghana with his hand to take the penalty and then stood there on the sideline and watched the penalty. They will do whatever it yeah. takes to win. So uh, Uruguay has that, but let's think about what will happen if they get out of this group. They finish second, they're probably meeting Brazil. That's difficult. I don't see them getting through that. If they finish first, most likely Serbia, I would think, or Switzerland, another tough uh, round of 16 matchup. So can they make a deep run? Possibly, but it, it's going to be extremely difficult. Mm-hmm. Here's my hot take. They're not getting out of the group. Yeah, I was going to say, you actually don't have them getting out of the group. You yeah. have Brazil and South Korea, right? Yeah, I think South Korea just, they're going to be a tough team to play against. I think they're going to be game. tough, but oh. I think Uruguay gets out of the All group. All of those teams so will be up for that Uruguay game because Uruguay have burned them at some point <laughs> during the World Cup. All right, guys, enough about Uruguay. Let's go to Albert's favorite team <laughs> yes. on this World Cup, Denmark. Yes, I love Denmark. They're such a lovable <laughs> I team. I think, you know, of course, Christian Eriksen's story is is one of those that mm -hmm. it, it just warms your soul it makes you feel like anything is possible and anything really is possible so i get the 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 love for this team and i don't think anyone dislikes denmark at this point their group also is relatively easy as well france australia tunisia mm -hmm. france in have trouble. a ton of injuries but i think france will still end up going through tunisia and australia i think denmark's better side mm -hmm. do we have denmark making a run here because I do. if I do. they go okay, just really quickly, if they go through second, they're likely facing Argentina. Yeah, that's the end of their that's road, the in thing. my opinion. If they go through first, they play Mexico, and they could maybe beat Mexico. So that yeah, it's probably gonna be Mexico or Poland. I truly believe that Denmark's gonna top this group. They've already beat France in qualifying. They've shown that they can play these big teams and get big results. And when I look at teams who who win the World Cup and go far, it's teams that have a familiarity with each other, mm -hmm. uh, like a camaraderie and a togetherness. And they don't really have a real weakness outside of an out-and-out -out number nine. But they do their goal scoring by committee. And we saw when their best player went down at the Euros, and Christian Eriksen, and no doubt he is their best player, they still persevered and almost knocked England out of the World Cup in the semis. and almost made the, uh, the World Cup, the Euro Cup, without their best player. Uh, they have a fantastic goalkeeper in World Cup qualifying, the most clean sheets under Kasper Schmeichel. They have it all. This is why I like them. But... It's so important that they top this group to avoid Argentina. That's also if Argentina finishes first in their yeah. group. Mm -hmm. You talk about the Euros there, and that's that's the one concern I have about Denmark. Is I believe the reason why they were able to rally at the Euros is because they had that moment for sure to really spark them. You know, and they when played some home matches as well. They yeah, they go through some adversity. It really brings the team together. You have something bigger to play for, which obviously was Christian Eriksen at yeah. the time. Will they have that same motivation this time around in order to top France? I they don't know, like I can see it. I can see it. I like it. That, uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens with France with all the injuries and all the drama surrounding mm -hmm. that team. Really quickly, we have two more. Croatia, that which we know of very well here in Canada. We've been picking apart this team. Um, I think most of us assume that they're going to go through. They're an older team, huh. but they have a lot of experience. <laughs> didn't you have at one point, like, Canada and Croatia? You, like, didn't trust Belgium or something? Listen, the thing is, with... This group that I'm concerned about with Croatia is that if they go through, whether it's first or second, they're likely going to have to play the likes of either Spain or Germany. Mm -hmm. Those are both really going to be tough games. Can Croatia, if they get out of this group, can they? And then they have to play probably Brazil or Portugal, actually. Mm -hmm. This side is insane. Can you really consider Croatia still a dark horse, though, at this point in time? Like, they've had success the last couple of major of tournaments and this one around I think people might be overrating them. Yes. Hey, yeah. listen, they're they've gotten older. You look at the squad individually and you go through the names and there's nothing that really stands out to me that screams this team can go deep in a tournament. Aside from the fact and it's something you guys have pointed out, collectively, mm -hmm. when this team comes mm -hmm. together, they seem to find a way to hit their stride. So that's I gotta see what this team looks like when the ball yeah. gets rolling right? they have a couple weaknesses though right i mean scoring is an issue no mm -hmm. really out and out number nine defense a bit old but like you said i mean this team can come together but getting out of the group and having to face those teams it's not gonna happen yeah i'm i'm curious about this one as well finally guys let's uh shed some light on serbia their group uh group in uh group g with brazil we know this um 
they have a decent side, but I still am having trouble seeing them go past if they get out of the group. I still don't know. I feel like Switzerland might go through. I like but if they get out, then they have to play, you know, the likes of whether it's Portugal, South Korea, Uruguay. It's yeah. going to be tough. Well, right now, what? They have the greatest striker in the world in Alexander Mitrovic, obviously, right? <laughs> then they have Vlahovic beside him. No, all joking aside. Mitrovic's is scoring record with not only Fulham but with Serbia is incredible. Injured gonna, though. Yes, but he injured. You know, injured <laughs> heading into the World Cup. He's fine. Trust me. Just like Anthony was injured for Manchester United, uh, they're going to lean on him a lot. But they have other pieces around them. Like in the midfield, they have Milinkovic Savage. They have a fantastic playmaker, mm. Dusan Tadic. I just think overall they have a very good team, and they've shown that they can beat some big clubs. I mean, they, they've beat. Portugal numerous times, and they're going to play teams of that caliber mm -hmm. potentially in the second in the round of sixteen. So it's will they go deep all the way to World Cup? Probably not, but they can make a run. I love this shout. I love this yeah. shout for Serbia. Yeah. Um, we talked about the players. The quality is there. Like, don't overlook this team on paper. They have a lot of high-profile players, but beyond that, there is this intangible about Serbia. When it comes down to a 50-50 ball, yeah. they're doing everything to win yeah. that ball. All hurt. All right? hurt. All hurt. You don't want to go into a 50-50 challenge with anyone on Serbia. <laughs> so, yeah, I think there's that that edginess to them. I think that'll, that'll yeah. do well. They're like right. 90 to 1 or something. So. Well, guys, let's see. There are a ton of dark horses. Obviously, we, there's many more. So, with... You know, a Tunisian side, we could maybe see them going to the final. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Who knows? But stick with us, guys. Up next, we're going to be talking Canada and Japan as they have a friendly on Thursday. And we'll also get into who we think is going to win the Golden Glove. Stick with us. All right, guys, let's talk some Canada soccer as the Canadian men's national team are back in action Thursday, Thursday morning for us as they take on Japan. Now, quick recap. Canada tied Bahrain a couple days ago in a draw 2-2. The entire team wasn't there. Now, everybody's there besides one infinite, infamous player in Alfonso Davies, who is still training and trying to recuperate with Bayern Munich. But from my understanding, he will be back just after this Japan game. Uh -huh. um, we've seen Canada qualify for a World Cup without Alfonso Davies. And this is a friendly how big of it is uh, is it a miss for Canada that he's he's not going to be here for this match? I think it, it's actually going to be a really big miss. Mm -hmm. And I'll say it's going to be a bigger miss against Japan than it will be against a team like the United States in January. John Herman has said this. When you go to World Cup, it's a different level. And Japan's a team that you face at a World Cup. Against a team like Japan, you don't really have space. You don't really have time on the ball. You need difference makers in your lineup. And Alfonso Davies is, a, is that difference maker. So now I'll be looking at guys like Jonathan David to step up and carry this, this load. Tejon Buchanan as well as another guy who can step up. Um, so yeah, they're going to have the game plan without Fonzi and we'll see how they do. Yeah, this is a big miss for them because you need this preparation for the World Cup because it's been so limited. And you want to start your best 11, which we think Herbin is probably going to do that, mm -hmm. um, at least for the first 45. And Alfonso Davies is in that best 11, right? And also, he's been off the pitch for a couple of weeks now with that hamstring injury. We want to see, you know, what he looks like. You know, how can he fare, especially in that type of weather? So I think him not being there is a miss, not so much the result, but just to see how he's going to gel in with the rest of the team after such a long layoff. Right. And Mikey, you kind of referenced it. Japan is definitely a World Cup squad. This mm -hmm. is a much tougher team than you know, the likes of a Bahrain. And we're seeing players like Minamino, Take, Tomiyasu. These yeah. are world-class players. How does Canada line up for this match with players like that on the pitch? Yeah, and it'll be, it'll be tough. Japan's a team that has kept clean sheets in five straight games. They haven't conceded in five straight. <laughs> in 2022, they've only lost one game. A 1-0 defeat to Brazil. So this is a team that knows how to play competitive football and it'll be i think in my opinion i think this japan game will be a bigger test than that uruguay game canada had a couple weeks back how do they line up against them well japan's a team that likes to press 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 canada have said they want to play with the ball okay now let's see it this mm -hmm. is a real challenge to see if you can actually hang and do what you say you want to accomplish and play with the ball against a team like japan who will be Serious threats, not maybe not serious threats, but definitely threats yeah. in this World Cup. And we had Peter Galindo on here yesterday. He mentioned that Japan could replicate what Croatia is going to bring to Canada in Group F. So that's that's what I really want to see, right? I mm -hmm. want to see how they manage to deal with a team like that because that's what they're going to see, right? Yeah. Uh, who knows? I mean, 
tactically teams can change certain things. Galindo actually mentioned that maybe a team like Belgium can change their tactics and that can give the possession to Canada rather than hold on to possession. So I want to see how Japan does that in this game and how Canada react to it. With the good thing about Canada and Herman is that they're so fluid tactically and I think you need that especially in a tournament like this. Yeah. Really quickly I just want to bring up Atiba Hutchison. Do you expect him to be starting this game? Uh, definitely. Mm -hmm. Definitely. This will only be his second appearance yeah. this year or this season. Uh, he went 70 minutes in the cup tie for Besiktas which was a great start but now you got to do it against you know in a non-cup tie against a team like Japan. How long can you go for and I think that this will be huge for getting him ready for Belgium. All right, guys. Well, Canada take on Japan Thursday, 840 Eastern, and we cannot wait. This is their last match until they step into their World Cup tournament, taking on Belgium next Wednesday. But up next, guys, we are talking the Golden Glove and who we predict is going to win it. So stay with us and we'll let you know. All right, guys. So with the World Cup fast approaching, we've spoken about the Golden Boot. So naturally, we must talk about the Golden Glove. To the best keeper in the World Cup, it tends to be somebody who might actually save the team, might be, you know, the one who brings it all together for a team. So much pressure is on these keepers. And I actually really enjoy this one because I feel like, especially when it goes to penalties, sometimes the keeper is really the MVP of a team. So let's quickly talk about who we think might be getting the Golden Glove. Albert? Yeah, I'll start with uh, Emmy Martinez from mm -hmm. Argentina. I just think you need a keeper that's pretty much going to go all the way. If you look at some of the former winners, uh, the, the last World Cup was Thibaut Courtois. Belgium didn't win the World Cup, but he was tied with clean sheets, I think with four other five mm -hmm. keepers, and it goes down to saves and minutes played, and it ended up being him. Uh, if you look at the last few World Cups before that, Iker Casillas, uh, Manuel Neuer, and Gigi Buffon all had the most clean sheets all won the World Cup. I'm expecting Argentina to win the World Cup. And when it comes to clean sheets, they're a team that can do that. And come of all qualifying, he was actually just below Ospina for Colombia with six clean sheets. So this award is not only for the keeper, but it's also based on the team in front of that keeper that can keep clean sheets. And Argentina is, you know, they've proved that in qualifying and during this 35 match on beaten run. Not to mention uh, Emmy's attitude. He is one to get into yeah. players' heads. He's nasty with it and he knows exactly what he's doing. That's funny because the goalkeeping position and for Argentina has always been one of the biggest question marks. They right. seem to have never gotten... Sergio Romero. One of, yes, yeah, exactly. Oh they, it could be that they found their guy and he mm -hmm. could make a difference. For me, mm -hmm. I'm going to go with a little bit of a lesser known commodity here. And that is Diego Costa of Portugal. Same reason as Albert. I think Portugal has a team that can make a deep run. However, in order to do that, I think they're going to need some really good goalkeeping because there are still question marks mm -hmm. in their center backs. So here's a guy who not a lot of people know, but is one of the best young up and coming goalkeepers in the world. And I believe he will be starting for Portugal. He's had a great season with Porto, nine clean sheets and yeah. 19 appearances. He's in form heading into this World Cup and this could be his breakout campaign. So I'm going to, I would say, good, especially good value, you can throw some money on Diego Costa. Great shout, just because Porto has been having a fantastic yeah. season. I'm going to go with an obvious one and say Alison Becker, but I'm going to say it for reasons not necessarily because of him. I'm going to go with the fact that Brazil's probably going to make a good run here. And they're a solid side with some amazing defenders, in my opinion. So I think naturally, Becker's a great goalie, but... I don't think many teams are going to even get to him. Mm -hmm. And you got to look at teams that are going to go the distance. So I think it will be Brazil. All right, guys. Well, it is anyone's game. Just to give you the odds for who we think might win the Golden Glove, we have Diego Costa at plus 1,400, Emmy Martinez at plus 700, and Allison Becker at plus 450. Just a couple shouts to some of the keepers we didn't mention. Courtois plus 500, Neuer plus 600, Loris plus 650, and Mikey's favorite to win, Unai Simon, at plus 600. <laughs> We'll see what happens. There's a long tournament ahead, so anything is possible. But guys, this is it for us today. We'll be back tomorrow talking Canada and Japan. So make sure you check out Room 442 for more footy content, and we'll see you tomorrow. Thanks for watching.